Another text question is, says, if all religions claim to be truth, then how can Christianity make that claim and think that it is correct? appreciate that question, <clears throat> and it's a question that has the assumption that is very correct. Oftentimes, the Christian takes the hit that he or she was a follower of Jesus Christ is the only one who lays claim to exclusivity. That is not true. <clears throat> Gautama Buddha was born a Hindu, and he renounced two of the fundamental doctrines of Hinduism, the authority of the Vedas and uh, the caste system. He could not accept those two went on his own journey in search of enlightenment and came, of course, with the uh, Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path and the ultimate extinguishing of desire in his nirvanic pursuit. So he turned his belief away from the religion of his birth in order to find a different answer. <clears throat> Islam is also exclusivistic in its claim, uh, in all of its precepts and its five pillars and so on. What about these contradistinctions? The first thing we need to know is there are distinctions, there are fundamental differences. At best, there are superficial similarities. <clears throat> I often hear the question posed wrongly. They'll say, are all religion, aren't all religions fundamentally the same and superficially different? No, they are fundamentally different and at best they are superficially similar. What are the fundamental claims, for example? In Buddhism, the goal is to ex extinguish hunger, extinguish desire. I remember talking to the first woman monk who was from Thailand to be ordained into the Buddhist priesthood. But Thai Buddhists do not ordain women, so she went to Sri Lanka to be ordained, and she has a PhD in philosophy from McMaster University in Hamilton, uh, Ontario. And... Uh, of Waterloo, I guess, Ontario, McMaster University there, got her PhD in philosophy, and she gave me the first interview. We chatted for well over an hour, one-on-one, -on -one, and I sort of angled into some questions because I didn't want to be too discourteous, and one of the things I said to her is, I hear you're married, and she said, yes. I said, you have children? She said, yes. I said, but you're living in a temple by yourself? She said, yes. I said, do you not see your children? She started crying. She said, I have a car. I said, you have a car? She said, yeah. I said, okay. So she drove herself because she can't allow uh, a man to drive her, she said. So she has to drive herself. And she says, every evening at the end of the day, I try and meet up with one of my children. She said, this is the hardest part of my life. I said, so you are on the journey to extinguishing the desire to be with your children. Is that right? Is that a fair assessment? She kept quiet. And then I said this. I said, the Dalai Lama has as his primary pursuit now the freedom of Tibet. She said, that's right. I said, why does he desire that? She looked at me and she said, we try not to get into these philosophical questions. Let's just say that he chooses to. You take a look at other world religions <clears throat> and see where these four questions are dealt with. Origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. These four questions have to be answered in two ways. Follow me, please. Every particular answer has to correspond to truth either through empirical form of measurement or through the logical reasoning process. And when those four answers are put together, they must cohere and not be incoherent. So the two tests, correspondence and coherence, I guarantee you only in the Judeo-Christian worldview will you find these four questions answered with corresponding truthfulness and with the coherence of a worldview. Let me take just one example and I don't say this to slight, but this is a fact, and we have to deal with it. I've been invited in many, many Islamic countries, and I have open forums there, and I'm going to go to one of the toughest Islamic countries within the next few weeks. They've hosted me in many parts there, and we've had dialogues. I want to give to you two things. In the Quran, it is the only historically claimed document 
that denies that Jesus Christ was actually crucified or died on the cross. Denies that. The Greek historians say he died on the cross. Roman historians say that. Pagan historians say that. Jewish historians say that. And Christian historians say that. The Islamic, uh, the, the Quran is the only one that says it appeared to him that he died, but he didn't actually die on the cross. So historically, it is making an affirmation that is really historically untrue. I got into a discussion with Sheikh Hussein of the leading Shiite cleric in Damascus, Syria. He's a real gentleman. For over three hours, we talked with an interpreter between us and an audience listening in. I was allowed to ask him one question about his faith, and he was allowed to ask me one question about mine. There was nothing, no rancor, no adversarial stance, just a perspective and counter perspective and back and forth. It's the best way to do it, really. At the end of it, Sheikh Hussein looked at me. He was very respectful through the whole time, always referred to me as Professor, Professor Zacharias, Professor Zacharias. And then at the end, he looked at me, leaned over, and he said, you know, Professor, I think the time has come for us in the Islamic world to stop asking if Jesus Christ died and to start asking why. I said to him, may I quote you on that, sir? He said, yes, you may. I'm, I'm hopefully going to go there before long, and I hope we can meet up again. Origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. The Judeo-Christian worldview is not the only one that claims exclusivity, but it's the only one that takes those four questions with corresponding answers that are truthful and coherent answers that stand the test of time. And the ultimate answer of the resurrection from the dead that gives you hope and meaning. I see we have one more question left, and uh, that's the sign here. I'll be happy to take that. For you is that through my you know, cursory review of most religions, it seems like they all have a common thread of answering the question which seems to plague us all, which is what happens to us when we die. It's the one question I think that a lot of us have difficulty with because we cannot answer it. And so it seems like this common thread is it gives us hope for the afterlife, something better than what we have right now. And it feels like, I feel like a lot of religions, that what they do is they put forth codes or rules of conduct to help us live a good life so that we can achieve this afterlife. And so given this commonality, what makes you believe that Christianity is the correct or right religion? <laughs> Great question. Great question. And your name is? Suketu. Spell that for me. S-U-K-E-T-U. Suketu. I think you've asked a very, very important question. First of all, let me qualify it a little bit, and I'm sure you already know that, that not all religions talk about an afterlife. Uh, mainly the monotheistic ones do. The pantheistic ones are reincarnation. Even the reincarnation between Buddhism and Hinduism is a little different. In Hinduism, it's the transference of identity one into another in a different form. But in uh, Buddhism, it's not even sure whether it's the identity that's transmigrated or just another form of essence that has emerged. A worldview is built not on one line of argument. A worldview is built on a connected series of arguments. And if a worldview were just built on one line of argument, I think this is the mistake naturalism often makes. It'll take sort of one argument that it has in its favor and forget all the myriad other questions that emerge. When I look at the person and the work of Jesus Christ, this is the most important question I had to ask. Now, granted, I asked it in reverse fashion because I was on a bed of suicide. A Bible was brought to me, and I prayed a prayer of desperation. I grant you that. I just had no hope. But I was read the verse, Jesus said, because I live, you also shall live. I just said, this is talking about a life that I don't have. And maybe this is the life I need. And so I prayed that prayer. But then I made a prayer commitment right on that bed. I was 17, and I said, Jesus, if you are who you claim to be, I will leave no stone unturned in my pursuit of truth. Because my goal was truth. Pragmatically, it made sense for me to hang on to a life jacket that was thrown my way. But then I began my years and years and years of study. When you look at the life of Christ from the prophetic schema of hundreds of years before, where he was going to be born, 
what he was going to do, what his name was going to be called, how the manner of birth was, the manner of life he was going to lead, how he was going to die, and then the resurrection from the dead. The uniqueness about the New Testament and Old Testament scriptures, it's not a single author. It's multiple authors. As you know, 66 books, 40 different authors have edited it. And it is interesting that Paul, Saul of Tarsus, who wrote one-third of it, came in a reverse fashion to the rest of them. The disciples came birth, life, death, resurrection, and that's how they found new Jesus. Not so with Saul, who came to be, who became Paul. He said, when he was encountered the risen Christ, he said that I may know him, the power of the resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death. He started with the resurrection, but he said he needed to understand the cross because he came in reverse chronological order, but he encountered the risen Christ. The conversion of Saul of Tarsus and Thomas especially, these two dramatic conversions are powerful witnesses of what happened. Saul who was killing them, he was standing, standing there watching Stephen being martyred and kept the clothes of those who were stoning him. Thomas who said, I'm not gonna believe until I see the resurrected Christ myself. And he went to India where there are 330 million deities. And he went and preached the gospel of Jesus and paid with his own life. That kind of dramatic transformation took place not because of just one event, but a connected series of events. So, here's the bottom line. A worldview is built around four questions. Origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. Origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. And there are three tests for truth. Logical consistency, empirical adequacy, and experiential relevance. Logical consistency, empirical adequacy, and experiential relevance. Three tests for four questions. And when you take the, the prophecy of Christ hundreds of years before from his virgin birth, you take the purity of his life unmatched, totally unmatched till this very day. Then the death that he promised for the forgiveness of sins and then the resurrection. As an Easterner, I asked myself this question. When Jesus was asked how he was going to demonstrate it, if he were a fake, he would have said, I'm going to spiritually rise again. And they would never be able to falsify it. But he said, I'm bodily going to rise again. That is an empirically falsifiable dictum. All they would have had to show him was the body and say, where is he? You said he was going to rise again. So it's in the whole schema of the prophetic corpus, the hundreds of years, the multiple authors, pointing towards the same, same person from his virgin birth to the purity of his life to the death on the cross for forgiveness when he said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they are doing. And then the resurrection again. My four questions are answered correspondingly with truth on specific questions and coherently when all of the questions are put together and answers are given. So to me, first of all, all religions are not the same. They are actually, they may, they, people say they're fundamentally the same, superficially different. Actually, they're fundamentally different and at best superficially similar. And the fundamental difference that you see in Jesus Christ is in his uniqueness and exclusivity of his claim and the embrace that he gives to all humanity, the perfection of his life, the purity of his life, the death and the resurrection. To me, that coherence of his answers convinces me that he is who he claimed to be. And truth, by definition, is exclusive. All truth claims to be exclusive. Buddhism claims to be exclusive. Hinduism claims to be exclusive. They all have exclusivity built into that. But in the person of Christ, you see the demonstration in his birth, life, death, and resurrection. So I say to me, I am convinced that because it coheres and because I have personally verified it in my own life, and you can do that too, and find that experience and that he is who he claimed to be. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask the next one from Twitter. Just um, to add something that Ravi's already mentioned, but the, uh, the resurrection was particularly key for me in my investigation uh, of this. I was studying philosophy. It was very important to me not to have to take some blind leap of faith and the fact that there was a publicly verifiable historical claim that I could look into was very, very important. And if you asked scholars a hundred years ago, how did we come up with a, a Christian myth of the resurrection? They would have said, well, one person 
told the truth to this person, that person told this person, that person told this person, and a few generations down the line, we had a crazy myth of the resurrection. Since then, in the last couple of decades, scholarship has really turned around on this question, in part because there are a few places in the Bible, in particular a passage at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15. Maybe you can have a look at it later. But it's a, it's a very early creed, and it lists all of the people and the groups that Jesus appeared to. He appeared to individuals and to groups at different times, in different places, doing many different things. And today, even the most atheistic critical scholars date that passage, that early creed, to almost immediately after Jesus' actual death and supposed resurrection. So the legendary development hypothesis has been thrown out of the window. What people know now is that there actually were a lot of people. The passage says hundreds of people, and then it says most of whom are still living, almost as if to say, go out and ask them yourself. There were many people who were utterly convinced they had seen this man, Jesus, alive and interacting with him after he had died. And so that then raises the question, what can account for that? What can account for this huge historical gap between what should have been the movement-ending death of Jesus and then the explosion of Christianity? Jews worshiping a man as God, unthinkable. The Sabbath changed from Saturday to Sunday, unthinkable. What bridges the gap which is there no matter what you believe? That's the question for anyone. Christians bridge that gap with the resurrection. When I was looking into this as a university student, I asked the top two skeptical New Testament scholars at Princeton to meet up for a coffee to talk about this. Because I said, this is what I've just laid out for you. This is what I'm seeing. Here's the big gap. And I thought, okay, Christians fill that gap with the resurrection, but surely those who aren't Christians must have equally plausible alternatives. And I said to them, how do you fill that gap? And one of them glanced towards a mass hallucination hypothesis which isn't taken seriously in the literature. She wasn't glancing towards it with any conviction either. There's simply too much data, too many appearances, too many people. Hallucinations are things that happen to individuals, not to groups. The other one who was a historian simply said, I'm not interested in that question as a historian. There was some sort of assumption that because it was a miraculous claim, it was therefore not within the remit of proper history, and I've never understood why. So. For me, the resurrection, the fact, that, the fact that you could have arguments that you can consider for that, was, that blew my mind. I just assumed that's an ancient claim that we could just never know whether that happened or not. But actually, you can look into it, and you can look at the facts, and then you can ask the question, what best explains the facts? And the reality is that today in the scholarship, the only explanation which is given any degree of credibility, is the fact that Jesus actually rose from the dead. Every other explanation has been completely undermined, and so I think it is a rational decision to say that actually happened, and then to take that next personal step of praying a prayer like the one that I prayed, which was, God, the Christian God, I don't know if I'm talking to anyone, but if I am, I'd